Welcome to Paranormal XL Podcast. If you are a first-time listener, welcome, and we hope you enjoy. If you are a loyal listener, well, you rock, and we big heart you. Yeah. So if you follow us, uh, or if you follow the Facebook page, then you already know the topic is out-of-body experiences. If you listened to last week's episode, then you know I told my story about my OBE, as I've seen it, and I'm like, oh, <laughs> that's OB. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, yeah, I discussed my, my experience last week that I've never told anybody before, so that was, that was a big step for me. <laughs> well, it's a good story. It's a good experience. It is. And with that being said, that's what made the research of everything very um, interesting to me. Because I'm like, okay, okay, but I don't agree. <laughs> <laughs> well, so. well, some of it you can and, and some mm-hmm. of it you can't. I think... Um, Everybody astro projects. Mm-hmm. They, a lot of times they just don't realize they do it. And then, you know, and sometimes I think on a psychological level, sometimes I feel like it's a coping mechanism that mm-hmm. we've developed over time where when something's hard to deal with, learning how to take yourself outside of your body kind of helps you deal with it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, I, I probably shouldn't. <laughs> I probably shouldn't tell this story, but I remember she's gonna anyway. The one time that I really did, because I'm, I'm going to share something personal that mm-hmm. I don't think I've ever actually shared with anybody. Mm-hmm. But um, and so, but I remember my ex was severely abusive, severely abusive, and I remember um, the one time there were several times, but there was one time he held me at gunpoint, and he was going to force the kind of sex where it's not natural. For anybody. Right. And so he told me that if I refused to do it, he would, um, he would make sure he, he would shoot himself and that the kids would blame me, you know, for the rest, rest of my life. And so I remember him forcing himself on me and literally I took myself out of my body so that I wasn't there. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So I, I think we're made to do that naturally. It's just mm-hmm. whether you choose to. Well, what triggers or not. that? Yeah. Essentially. So I think sometimes, like you said, you know, you'd say something traumatic like that happening, would, I, I, I would say would do it, where you, mm-hmm. you're like, oh shit, something's happening to me, like emotionally right now. <laughs> Escapism. Yeah. So I would almost think that the stuff that Ethan has went through in the past, he'll block himself off where he's yeah. daydreaming is what some people refer to it as whatever. But I think essentially, I don't want to say with the research, and we'll get into that in a little bit, it's, um, to me, there's almost different types of out-of-body mm-hmm. experiences where one that you can see yourself, one that you don't. You emotionally take yourself out. You may not go anywhere, but you're shut completely down. To me, I would consider that an out-of-body experience because you're taking your your spiritual self out of your physical body yeah. because that's being harmed. Mm-hmm. And I think... Now that I say that all out, <laughs> it all, you know, kind of clicks with me. And when I think about Ethan and him going through some of the things that he did in his past, it does make sense. When he's in a very uncomfortable situation, he zoop, does that. So it has become learned to him. Now he knows that he can do that if he gets in a situation. Yep. And, you know, if something like that were to happen again to you, probably same thing. We're just, yeah. But I remember, you know, with my story, it was... I don't know why I remember that. I, I just don't, but I do remember. I do remember I did not like to go over there. I don't remember why I did it. We don't get along with that side of the family no more. I, I just really don't know why. Like, so, like, with that being said, well, maybe, um, you know, something kind of traumatic happened to you there. So you naturally just would take yourself out. And therefore, so you as I'm older trying to think back, I blocked that out, kind of threw it away, essentially. Because yeah. I've been, ever since I actually told that story out loud, all week, that's what I've been thinking about. I'm trying to go back and replay, try to trigger my memory 
from being young. And there's so many empty spots where, like, you would think, okay, well, you can remember something from when you were three, but you can't remember something from when you were six, you know, mm-hmm. or whatever. But I, there's so many spots that are just missing. And I think, ah, I don't know. Maybe something did bad happen. I, But I was young and the innocence was still there. I knew it wasn't good. So I was like, you're out of here. Mm-hmm. But in the long run, I do think when that happens to children, something like that, and they block it out, have the out-of-body experiences, whatever. Not that I want to say it'll come back out later in life, but it'll eventually come back out. And that's what's happening to me right now. Since I've said it out loud, it's sticking with me now. Not that it's going to affect who I am. Some people, it does. People in my family <laughs> have had some traumatic things happen to them. And and now that I, like I'm older and kind of see, you take yourself out of the little picture, whatever. Well, know. everybody, you know, <laughs> families always just experience trauma. You know, and I think that's where you get your your haunted houses from or mm-hmm. things that occur just because trauma occurred there. And so learning how to um, escape helped you deal is the best way to say it. And mm-hmm. Everybody has their skeletons in their closet. Oh, yeah. But I think uh, there's so many ways to ask project. Mm-hmm. It's it's really amazing when you, if you want to ever practice it and, and really try to it put is. yourself Yeah, off. we're going to veer away from the bad part because that's yeah. kind of what we jumped into but that was just trying to give you experiences from what we had well like it, it really has all to do with it i think you know i guess from a scientific point of view i think it is real but i think there's several reasons as to why <laughs> I, I don't know i think like if it's something you want to learn you mm-hmm. can grow stronger from it yeah look like a self-induced obe yeah yeah i got stuff on that too where the science part of it, I got some info in here from um, them doing uh, experiments um, on it. And it just, why would you do that? <laughs> but we'll, I do have that in my, my nose. We will get to I'm jumping around. Okay. And last wing everything back in. So we will start out with <laughs> the, the actual definition of out-of-body experience. A sensation of being outside one's own body, typically of floating and being able to observe oneself from a distance, which we all can agree, essentially. But at the same time, as we just said, we think that there are different levels of -of out-of-body experiences where one, where you could see yourself, at least, I don't know, observe where you are, um, and then ones where you just kind of black out, I guess, Mm -hmm. essentially. You block that out, that part. But one out of every ten persons say they have experienced one which I thought was an interesting number. Um, but again, it's kind of one of those things where, you know, you and I never talked about our stories before, <laughs> you know, where that number could be higher when you think about it. People just not saying because they're like, oh, I was sleeping, it was a dream. You or know, and there's a lot of it. Yeah, oh. Because it can be scary. Oh, heck yeah. So I got, um, there was, while I was researching, I found what, some believe to be triggers of an out-of-body experience, which is sleep, just before falling asleep or just prior to waking up, seems to happen more when in a light sleep, obviously. Um, science says noise, stress, or illness are known causes for this, which I can totally get, like, the stress of it. Mm-hmm. Everybody's got different levels of stress that would want you would want to take yourself out. Kind of a break, a little body vacation. Yeah. <laughs> Um, physical effort, extreme exertion, which, yeah. But I think that would fall, to me, that falls under, like, I don't want to say hallucinating, but when you're overly tired, things happen. Like, I don't know, you see things. Yeah. Type of thing. You know, Mm -hmm. and a lot of that, people say that's essentially what all paranormal is. Oh, you're just tired. Oh, you're... It's not all... So it's such a great area, because it's not all like that. It's different for every person, I think. Mm Mm-hmm. So... Um, and then near death experience. Other times people say this has happened to them is during meditation, but isn't that in some meditations, isn't that what you're trying to do? Yes. Okay. Yep. And then a- anesthesia, which is a classic one when you're, you know, going through surgery. Hypnosis, which I, I remember we had a hypno, hypnoser, <laughs> hypnoser come in. <laughs> I believe it was psychology class. Um, 
they came in and only half of the class, like, allowed themselves to get hypnotized. So you really have to let go, kind of like in meditation. Yes. You have to let go and, and listen to what's being said to you. Um, I I don't know. I, I don't know if I believe totally the hypnosis doing that. Um, because that's somebody altering you to do it. I, I don't know. It can. It's, well, it's what, it's what you would call a guided meditation, too. Okay, yeah. Because I remember... um. When I was, you know, a long time ago when I was in therapy, he did hypnosis with me. And then mm-hmm. later when I started meditating and doing guided meditations, I realized it was the same exact thing. It okay. is. And so it's just like doing that guided meditation where you're allowing yourself. It helps you um, picture it, but taking your mind out of your body. Okay. And that's the whole, that's how you start to astral project is to lay down and relax like you're going to go to sleep mm-hmm. and then pull all of your energy up into your mind. And then just allow your body to completely relax so you're not thinking about it anymore. Okay. And that's that's where you're going to go into that sleep where you're asleep, but you're aware of everything around you. And I'll get that a lot. Um, that's when a lot of times that spirit will come in and, with a message for me or for somebody else mm-hmm. where I'm sleeping, but I'm completely aware of everything that's around me. And I've astral projected. I'm, I'm completely communicating Right. With spirit. And I've taken those messages and you're right. like, yeah, that's that's exactly it. I get it. So, like, in my mind, it makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> um, where you said, you know, you're taking all your energy and putting it up to your head. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, so, where you would just relax enough because then you're not, your energy isn't being like, oh, I need to move my legs. So, you're taking because you're just relax. This did have something to do with our conversation. I can't remember right now. It is so hot in here. I might be having a heat stroke. <laughs> Stick off your shirt. Well, I was just about to, but I got I got the PXL tank top <laughs> underneath my PXL t-shirt. But, um, astral projection, a lot of you got to think about it. Like, a lot of people th- say or think that, okay, so when you're astral projecting, you're taking your soul out of your body to ash project and that's not the case you're taking your consciousness and you're moving it elsewhere so that's why you draw all that energy up into your head because that's where you're going to visualize you're not really leaving your body you're going to go somewhere else in your mind Mm -hmm. you're going to go somewhere with your consciousness not your body i I think that's the best way i can explain it that's what happens when you meditate is it's you know you, you take yourself right out of here you stick yourself in that present moment and just allow yourself to be. It's all so fascinating. And I'm <laughs> so many questions I want to ask you. They sound good in my head, but I can't find the words for them to come out of my mouth. So. Oh, they'll come out eventually. <laughs> I know. <laughs> oh, another one was childbirth. <laughs> of course. because <laughs> We're not even going to get into that one. Suffocating and after being shot. Which those are near death to me would be near death experiences, if not death experiences. Mm -hmm. Um, Scary things. So again, I think that comes back to a dramatic thing happening. So you are leaving your your physical body for a minute. Um, Induced, induced, induced um, out of body experience. Drugs, of course. Sensory uh, deprivation or overload. Strong G forces, um, which. It's gravity-induced loss of consciousness, which that's what, like, NASA calls it. Mm-hmm. So that's the science term of it. With pilots and astronauts can experience out-of-body experiences when extreme G-forces are endured. Blood can partially drain from certain parts of the brain that make this happen for them. Oh. Which, yeah, I thought that was interesting. And that makes sense because that's what Native Americans do mm-hmm. is, you know, when they go on their spirit quest, they deprive themselves of food and water so Mm -hmm. to the point where eventually they're gonna you know go into their trance okay Mm -hmm. um not getting more into the science part this this is this is cool (laughs) verifying vertical perception one of the most controversial aspects of obes is vertical perception it is claimed that during an obe one is able to literally float float out of one's body and witness something they otherwise would not have. So, like, this would not be, like, an awake, out-of-body experience. 
like I had, mm -hmm. you know, being little, because I was watching myself play still. But an example you may have heard about is Pam Reynolds. She had invasive surgery to remove a brain tumor. She was able to recall things during the procedure while she was clinically dead. She told them upon waking up, she had scanned the scene of the room. As always, skeptics <clears throat> come about, but believers of the afterlife have repeatedly used her story as evidence of an ability to float beyond the body. Mm -hmm. I thought those other stories that, like, I would love to hear where, you know, she, she was clinically dead and was able to recall, you know, maybe a conversation the doctors were having or he dropped the scalpel, you know, or whatever, mm -hmm. and she yeah. was able to tell him that, you know. Those ones, I think, are very, um, very neat. Probably scary, but very neat to hear about. Well, that is an interesting story. Um, so what do you think they feel? What do you think it feels like to Ashley Project? Like, what do you think it would feel like for your body? For my physical body? Mm -hmm. I don't know. So I know... I know for a long time I avoided doing it because I was afraid of, you know, the energy and the vibration of mm -hmm. it and how it would feel. But there's, you know, there are several signs that you have. Like, one thing would be, like, sleep paralysis, mm -hmm. where um, you've woken up, but you feel like you can't move. And so that's a sign that you are astral projecting. The Those times where you're getting ready to go into a deep sleep and you jump and you wake yourself mm -hmm. up, mm -hmm. that's astral projection. You just woke yourself that up doing it. falling. Yeah. Yep. And then, um, like, a charge of vibration where your body's shaking when you raise your vibration so high. Because that's what happens. Just the more you relax, the higher your vibration gets. And you can hear, like, tunnel noises in your ears. Like, I can always tell when my vibration's really high because I hear it. Um, it's kind of like a humming mm -hmm. in my ear. And uh, that gets really loud and your body starts to shake. So if you wake up feeling like that, you know that your body was getting ready to do you know, astral projection and then just, you know, hearing different kinds of noises or having a, a sense that you're sinking down into your bed and that you're getting really heavy on your bed. And that's really not that sensation. It just means your energy is starting to float because that's what's leaving is your energy. Okay. Okay. So like separating. Mm -hmm. but, yeah. Okay. Now I know there's other times that it's happened, but the, like I said, I keep going back to that one call from that experience is being up here. I don't, and seeing myself, mm -hmm. I was playing. I wasn't saying anything, though. So do you think I was, like, in just, like, this weird trance, maybe? Well, for me, it's like, yeah, I think you, you kind of took yourself out of that situation and connected more with your higher self. Our higher, our higher self is always on the other side of the veil. Mm -hmm. You know, that's the whole part of, you know, the spirituality. So and I wanted to go means. hang out with the cooler me. Yeah. Okay. The more peaceful. Oh. oh I like her. <laughs> I need to go visit her again real soon. Um, yeah. Because now that I, like, think about it, like, the sleep stuff, or sleep out-of-body experiences, and, like, you know, with Pam Reynolds, you know, she's in surgery, knocked out. Those ones I kind of, under not that I understand. It's more relatable. Yeah. I, but I, I think they're more relatable because they've been put into mainstream and accepted. So right. when you're looking at something that hasn't been accepted by mainstream, it's harder to, um, it's harder to confirm it in your own mind. It is because I do remember telling myself, and this is, I, this part I remember on a few different times was telling, you need to get back in there because there's times where I will, if I am overwhelmed, stressed, and I'm like, I, not that I can see myself out here, but I know I'm not fully in here. Mm -hmm. I don't know where the hell I am, <laughs> but I know I'm not fully, I'm not up to my 100% physical self, you know? Where I'm like, okay, you need to get your shit together, right? Ground myself, per se. Am I mm -hmm. saying that correctly? Yeah, exactly. I'm learning. I'm learning. That draws you back in. <laughs> Did you have some more that you wanted to go over? Or no, go know? ahead. Okay. Let's get back to some science. Yeah. The love of the science guy. He's not in this episode. Sorry, guys. <laughs> okay, back to the science, some of the science of out-of-body experiences. A, a Canadian neurosurgeon simulated people with epilepsy. He simulated their right temporal lobe, and the patients were reported saying, oh, my God, I'm leaving my body. A Swiss group worked with ep epilepsy patients as well. They passed... Blah. They passed a weak current through their right angular gyrus where the... 
parietal lobe meets the temporal lobe. Patients were reported saying they had a sensation of falling from a height. When they increased the current, they said, I see myself lying in bed from above, but I only see my legs and lower trunk. Which I'm not sure what that particularly means. But Blank, one of the Swiss scientists involved, believes that OBEs are related to failure to integrate multi-sensory info from one's own body at the TBJ. Which is another word I can't say. <laughs> well, it, it's interesting when they, they make the statement, you know, mm-hmm. <laughs> when they make the statement that I can see my, my, I can see myself, but I can only see my legs and my trunk. One of the easiest ways to astral project is when you're laying there and you, you've taken all that energy and moved it up into your head and you start to relax more and more is picturing, just picturing you starting at your feet and the energy moving, leaving your feet and then moving up your legs and then moving up your trunks. And that's where you stop. So knowing that and see it and looking at that statement, it kind of makes you think probably why you can only see that because the energy doesn't move, leave from up here. Right. But it leaves from, Oh, does that make sense yeah. to you? What I'm trying to say? Yeah. That's just a theory. It doesn't mean it's correct, but just a theory. Hmm. Anything else? <laughs> well, um, do you know what lucid dreaming is? No, but I like that song. <laughs> well, it, it's a very, uh, it's like, <laughs> um, a very strong dream. Yeah, well, lucid dreaming is a dream that you can control yourself. Okay. And, um, you can teach yourself how to lucid dream and to get better at it. But a lot of times when we're astral projecting, it's actually what we're doing. We're going into a lucid dream where we experience everything that we want to experience. Mm-hmm. We, we're going to the astral realm. That's what you, what you do when you astral project. And you experience it, but you can control the situation. So when okay. you feel like you're flying, you really are flying. Your energy is flying. But um, a lucid dreaming, that's um, so easy to develop. And for the lucid dreams, they're colorful and... It's where, that is where, it is where you go when you astral project. It's the best way to, um, to explain it. And if you want to develop the ability, you know, start during your day asking yourself, is this a dream? And just kind of, you know, every once in a while say that to you because you're programming your brain. Mm -hmm. So then when you start to try to practice the, you know, out of body experience, you'll get to that point and then your brain will activate because it's your subconscious part of you. Right. And they'll say, is this a dream? And it'll snap you right into it. Hmm. hmm. I'll have to try that. <laughs> yeah, well, it is. It's fascinating. Just, you know, cause why not try it? You're not in any danger. Right. And it's going to, it's going to increase not only your gifts, but your spirituality. Cause there's so much more than just what we always see on this dimension. There's so much more out there well, physically to embrace. Us. If you, if you want to do investigations, if you want to do readings, if you want to, be able to help people on a larger scale, expanding your horizons and exposing yourself to the other possibilities of just what's in front of you mm-hmm. makes a big difference. The more, the sure. more you expand and experience, the better you get. Mm-hmm. The more, the more you expand, the, you will find your answer as to why you can't remember. Okay. In that house. You see what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. But it's a process. You have to find one little piece of the puzzle, then you find another one and you research it. And then eventually it comes together as a whole. Together. Then you have the aha moment. Aha. And then you, then you move on to the next the next puzzle. <laughs> oh. <laughs> There's more. <laughs> There's always a puzzle. No. It's more of what I got from one of the articles, which these ones I'll read. But I don't know. So we'll discuss that when we're done. <laughs> so um the out of body experience was long considered a medical mystery, at least one Out of 10 people have reported having such an experience. Many of those experiences were passed off as delusions, but as more and more patients reported OBEs, the scientific community began taking it more seriously. Um, OBE can be artificially induced, which that's essentially what we were just talking about. Um, In 2007, Scientific American reported about a study where neuroscientists used a video camera virtually and virtual reality goggles to induce a sensation that most would describe as an out-of-body experience. 
See, I think that's cool, but at the same time, that is so irrelevant to me. Because, eh, it's a video game. You're not, you're not, you're not really doing it. You're not meditating to get yourself there to experience the real thing. What they're showing you is they're taking what people have reported to say, seeing, and they're just putting it in front of your eyes. Mm -hmm. Because I've done the VR thing with video games. It's cool as shit. It is neat. That's neat that something that. like that. Yeah. Yep. Um, but as far as that, to me, that's what it would be. I'm playing uh, an OBE video game. That's, mm -hmm. you know, so that's I don't feel like, yeah. yeah, so that shouldn't even been in there. <laughs> Scientist. Um, <laughs> OBE may be a trick of the brain. In 2009, three neurosurgeons with the Coma Science Group Cyclotron Research Center in Belgium published an article titled Towards a Neuroscientific Explanation of Near-Death Experience that outlined how the temporal partial <laughs> cortex is involved during the out-of-body experience. This added weight to the theory the cause of those experiences is physical and located somewhere within the brain itself. See, again, science is like, the brain, the brain, the brain. Well, yes, the brain is so amazing. Science can only get so far, and then they're out of, they're out of answers because there is no answer for essentially why it's doing what it's doing. Well, the brain connects us to our God consciousness, and that is the truth. If you, if you do some research, and... It, we won't go off huge off topic, but <laughs> you have you have the pineal gland. And so, the more you develop that, not the penis gland. <laughs> you see my eyes? <laughs> no, like I, I was trying to be so good. <laughs> I, I was like, she's, she's, she's gonna, gonna lose it. She's gonna, gonna lose it. She's gonna say penis. <laughs> but, but anyway, <laughs> it, that's what you develop to to open up your third eye. That's your third eye. Okay. And so all these little triggers, they're like little, I don't know, when I, when I picture them, all these pieces in your brain, they're connected. Mm -hmm. And only half of the brain is lit up. So what, what, what would happen if you were able to light the rest of it up? And that's what astral projection and meditation is all about. It's about lighting the fuse to those other little pathways mm -hmm. and opening up more because there's so much more out there. We don't even use enough oh, of our yeah. brain to be able to see it. That's why a lot of people can't see because most of that's all closed off. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm going to have to research more into that. Just like, you know, the eye of Horus, there's research that shows that the pineal gland inside the brain looks like the eye of Horus, which was Ra, the sun god. Okay. The, you know, the, the greatest, the greatest god of the Egyptians, the one, the creator Okay. Okay. They're, they're, you know, according to their beliefs. I think there's just so many different aspects. And by, you know, opening up, you can find them. Just like, have you ever heard of uh, Dr. Raymond Moody? Mm -mm. They're talking about the, the neuroscience. He was very, very involved with trying to explain it. And, you know, he, you know, he dismissed it. it he basically oh, yeah. said that, you know, anybody who, has an OBE, it's because there's a, you know, dysfunction in the brain until he had his own. You know, he's, he spent decades interviewing hundreds of people and collecting the data. And then finally, he had his own. And he, he admitted it, huh? He did. And then that's when he really started to do a different kind of research. Okay. And he's even created the steps of how you can teach yourself to do it. Okay. Because huh. he had his own experience, so he needed it to... And that's yeah. essentially, really, starting this paranormal thing, it's always been something I've been interested in. But this is triggering because of how he was at first to me. <laughs> so, like, people don't, are so quick to be like, nope, that's not what you saw. Nope, you didn't see a ghost. Nope, you can't tell me nothing. <laughs> that type of thing. Until they experience it themselves. And they're like, oh. And then even then, sometimes they're like, nope, because they're not going to tell anybody because mm -hmm. they made a big stink out of it. Don't. Don't ever yell somebody else is young. We've said that all along. That's this right. is essentially the same thing. He was mad and because he never experienced one, he called everybody BS on it. Like, yeah. it's not real. Forget it. And I think that's, even growing up, I we our brains get taught at a very young age. Um, this kind of goes back to last week's episode where it comes to a point where our brain starts 
picking things out, what it's going to remember, what it's going to retain, yeah. what makes sense, what it's going to rationalize. And if it can't, it's going to throw it away. So mm -hmm. it's not real. We think this way because it's not real. And, and But we're taught that way because of the way that we're brought up. Yeah. I'm, I'm kind of, I don't know. I could ramble. <laughs> <laughs> well, they even say that, you know, having an OBE is very healing for your physical body. Oh, I could imagine. It takes you out and you're able to, it's like, a, it's a natural healing for your mm -hmm. body. It's able to release from that stress and let go and what no longer is serving it energetically mm -hmm. by just pulling away. Mm -hmm. So I found that fascinating. As a healer, mm -hmm. I found that research to be very fascinating that. Well, I think it's really awesome that, that he did experience one and that he kind of was like, oh, I need to slow my roll. And wow, I'm going to take it different. He was still open-minded enough to, to research it. Yes. Oh. oh, that's, yes, that's what I always, Yeah. We, you don't necessarily, yeah. necessarily have to agree with everything that we say or anybody else says, but just don't be like, no, and then close yourself off from it, because who are you to say that it's mm -hmm. not there, doesn't, yeah. doesn't exist, you know, it, if you can prove it, cool, but you better make sure you have all your P's and Q's and T's and I's dotted and crossed and all that jazz <laughs> with it. Make sure your goddamn ducks are in a row. Yeah. Mine waddle all over. <laughs> it's like that meme. They're, they're on a rave. <laughs> so, <clears throat> so in this same one that I was reading before, um, OBEs can occur during dreams. Well, duh. <laughs> Another longstanding biology, really, biological explanation for out-of-body experiences is based on sleep paralysis and the circadian rhythm. Numerous sleep studies prove that people pass through an intermediate sleep stage between wakefulness and REM sleep when the REM, REM system produces paralysis. For some people, the REM system can malfunction and cause paralysis while the person is still alert, inducing feelings of floating outside of the body in combination with the vivid dreams. See, I'm not totally against that, but they didn't give me a reason why. See, and this is where, okay, science and spiritualism they're both right because they're coinciding together mm -hmm. because, okay, this tells you physically what's going on, but in the spiritual world, that's happening, phys happening physically because you're, oh, <laughs> your, your consciousness, okay. your soul consciousness. Okay. I can't say consciousness. You just did. Did yeah. I? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yay. Okay. Consciousness is, is separating. So like, I'm not totally against, I guess this one. I just hate when I'm trying to research, like, complete science facts, but they only give half of it. They're forgetting, like, the other half. And they're, they, I think they just close themselves down to the possibility that, hey, there's more than what really meets the eye here. Yeah, they want just facts. And, and that's fine. But. It's not the whole picture. But yeah. you have to add in the other facts or possible facts, too. Mm -hmm. That's the science stuff on this kind of. Kind of gets me going. Oh, because not that I totally disagree, but there's, they left a lot open. Mm -hmm. And it's so possible that, yep, you know, you're in that REM sleep, produces paralysis, blah, blah, blah. Yep. But this is the reason why that's happening. Well, maybe. Because you're leaving. They, maybe they left it open because they can't really explain it. Right. But well, that's exactly it. And that's fine. But admit it. You know, that's, that's what makes me mad. Just yeah. admit it. That's okay. That's true. And we're not necessarily saying what, what we think's happening. It may not be true, but this is what we, we think's happening. Yeah. yeah. I'm just telling you from experience. Um, Because I, I like to see things from both sides, but especially on this out-of-body experience one, case studies support physical explanations. The scientific explanations are supported by numerous case studies, which show that the biological cause may very well be the answer to OBE. On the other hand, there are elements of those experiences that science has yet to explain, such as how people can report specific and remote locations and events they witnessed during the OBE that they had not physically witnessed. Due to these reports, science still falls short in providing a viable explanation for all of these experiences. And see, that's, to me, that's what all these things should say. <laughs> well, yeah, because there's, like we said, there's, we believe that there's different levels of the OBEs, and the, this one especially, that should be half of your evidence right there that we are two separate, like there's the physical being, then there's their spiritual selves, and we can s separate for a period of time. Yeah. I, I, I think 
think that we should. <laughs> well, I like that they kept it like open ended where yes, there's still that possibility they couldn't disprove it. Where like the other ones were like, no, oh, you just can't do it. We can't find any evidence. So yeah, but then they can't even explain their evidence that they yeah. do have to try to explain that it doesn't exist. So yeah, and they're just like, no, nope, we're done. Psh, doesn't happen. Um, when spiritual practices induce out-of-body experiences. There are a number of spiritual beliefs from around the world and throughout history that incorporate some form of the OBE experience. In these cases, believers explain the experience as having a spiritual cause. For example, Hinduism is very well known for supporting the concept of astral projection in spiritual travel outside the body. The practice is incorporated into Hindu uh, meditative practices. Additionally, many pagan religions also believe in inducing the spirit to separate from the body and explore the world on the astral plane. Okay, so back to what I was explaining earlier to you <laughs> about my conversations with those fellows from work. Oh, yeah. Okay. So the one and I, he was asking me questions. He does every so often um, ask me how like the podcast is going, the investigations and stuff. But he also knows that I'm looking more into, um, you know, the researching of the Wiccan and pagan ways. So, you know, he asked me questions. Like I said, I, I don't know if he's just trying to pass time or if he's really interested or whatever, but I'll talk about it, you know, if he's going to ask questions. But we're having a conversation, and the guy from the other press peeps up, and he heard him ask me what a pagan is or paganism. So I tried to explain it to him, and I bring up Wiccan, too. Well, that must have been what triggered the other guy, because then he's like, oh, they're an atheist. Oh, my gosh. I about went to the other side of that press and put him through his own press. That mother peeper. Yeah. Again, that comes down to, if you're going to peep into, well, first of all, it was A-B conversation. See, you're way out. Yeah. <laughs> but if people want to jump in, that's fine, but educate yourself. He jumped in, and he had no idea. Yeah, that's... Uh... It has nothing to do with that. That uh, paganism is a belief in the you know the god, but that there's other gods also that you can utilize. Yes, and that's exactly what I was explaining. I said because then he said, "Well, they don't worship God." I said, "They worship a god." All religions, they you're not even worship, but they praise to something to something higher. Yeah. Yes, something bigger than they are. It's something that we can't see. It. Yes, exactly. And I'm like, what? That's complete opposite. Like, you are so wrong. I can't even help you. Like, right now, I can't even be nice to you because you're so wrong. And I'm, like, the nicest person at work. <laughs> at work. At <laughs> work. <laughs> just <No>. at work. <laughs> but that just really upset me. But that goes back to when I'm like, okay, if you're going to talk to me about this stuff, because I am trying to learn and educate myself so I can back up my opinions. So I tell, unless you have something to back your opinion up, yeah, don't like the facts that come along yeah. with it. So he's like, let's get the Google machine. So he gets out his Google machine, looks up Wiccan. Exactly, almost word for word what I said. Uh-huh. And exactly. I'm like, well, pal, you it, it, that just really, really, it really upset me. <laughs> well, yeah. Um, like the pagans, they, they, they're not so much realist, you know, ritualistic like the Wiccans are. Mm -hmm. and the, you know, the witchcraft itself is a practice of magic. Mm -hmm. But, you know, they all have connection with each other but just like every other religion has mm -hmm. connection right you see that's they think just because it's not something that i guess like christianity that's been out there forever and ever and ever people like are ashamed to say that they're christian because it's acceptable because it's been around for whatever mm -hmm. okay that's fine i may not be that way you you know but I don't know. The whole thing, we can stay on that forever. But, yeah, that just really made me angry because he kind of jumped to conclusions when he had no idea and did yeah. not let me finish. So then the other guy was like, B guy, let me finish my explanation to A guy because he's the one that asked the question. A guy said Native Americans, what they do. Yeah. The, the elements yeah. and stuff. So, you know, and he knew once I put two and two together for me. He's like, oh, okay, all right. It's you all know? about nature and honoring the nature and believing in, you know. It's not scary. So many people that think that it's dark, that it's, it's not. dark and, and Satanism. And I'm like, what? You guys are so not, wrong. No, not at all. It, no. And that's why people disregard it. And that just angers me because even if you don't believe it, educate yourself. And that's, I'm educating myself on other there's, religions. There's darkness in every single religion. If you, you know, think about the Catholic priests, Mm -hmm. who are always sexually abusing little boys, that's darkness. 
And yes. that's one of the biggest relig- religions there are. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's, there's problems with that, but if you, so, if you're if you're not going to judge that, but you're going to judge a pagan who wants to go sit under a tree and pray and meditate, right, and be out in nature, like and, and help people and heal. I'm just saying. I mean, by all means, go for it. That's that's you, but don't bring your ne- negativity to me. Yeah. <laughs> and if you want to ask me questions, that's fine, but don't. Don't irritate our pineal gland. <laughs> yes, that's exactly it. <laughs> but <laughs> well, you don't need no penis glands in here. No. <laughs> but just how he came about it. Like, if he just would have said, I'm, I want in on this conversation. Explain to me what you think or what you know what Wiccan or Pagan is. Okay, cool. But no, to come in and say that they're atheists, uh, what? No, then they would be called atheists. Not yeah. a pagan, not a Wiccan. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with atheists either. There's something wrong with any religion. If that's what you believe and how you were raised and your thought pro that's great. Hold on to your belief. Mm-hmm. That's awesome. Believe in something. That's great. But that just threw me for, for a loop. I was so ready to go. <laughs> it's hard having conversations with close-minded people. Yes. Or not even... He's really not even that close-minded. He's actually a really nice guy. I, a really nice guy. I think that's the only time I've ever been like that agitated with him where I just had to stop talking. So I'm like, <sighs> really? And then you're going to get the Google machine out so I can tell you exactly what I just told you. And, but if that's how you got to prove to yourself that pagans are not atheists, then by all means you do it because you should <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> look it up. But also back to the religion thing, there's more of that in here. So we just went through how, like Hindu and pagan religions, they they, they use this practice, the, the out of body experiences that they induce them. It helps them. It's well, it's, it helps you grow spiritually to yes. see to see where sort of like where you come from, so to speak, in mm-hmm. a sense, energetically. Mm-hmm. Right. So Christianity is split on the issue depending on denomination and. Um, and some Christians even believe that the practice opens up the soul to a dimension where demonic forces and evil entities reside. By contrast, many New Age practitioners of deep meditation and astral travel believe that traveling in the spiritual realm is a natural human gift that should be cultivated and developed. Uh, the one common theme that runs throughout all of these beliefs is that the phenomenon is induced by an altered state of consciousness where you are able to exist consciously and travel in spirit form even when your body is not dead. So I guess, okay, yeah, they all, well, they all know what it means, but some of them believe that it's it's a bad thing. Mm-hmm. Just And I think they believe it's a bad thing because they can't explain it. Because it's fear-based. Yes. And that just, that saddens me when there's fear-based stuff out there. Again, that comes back to just educating yourself on it. Mm-hmm. Get the Google machine out. Shoot. Answer the questions uh, yourself. Find a podcast. Uh, there's tons of them out there with the information that you might be looking for on stuff like this. I mean, yeah. I, don't be fear, feared of much. I mean, I fear spiders. Fear those. <laughs> but when it comes to stuff like this, don't fear it. Educate yourself on it. Look at both ends of it. Why people are scared. But this is what it really is. Mm-hmm. And this is what it may do. Okay. I'm good. You know, but, um, do you oh, have something? I have steps here that, so if you're interested in learning how to astral project and actually control it yourself versus just accidentally doing it while you're sleeping, because everybody does, um, we'll go through the steps. So step one, relax both physically and mentally, you know, lay on your back and just start to relax So give yourself time to get into that mode. And then two, this is where you want to enter a hypnagogic state, like a half-sleep state. And that's where we talk about, you know, bringing that energy up and not allowing your body to relax, but bringing the energy up into your brain because you're, that, that way your body goes to sleep, but you're still aware. Right. Okay. So step three, start to deepen the state by prior to prioritizing the mental sensation over the physical sensation. So start to feel it up here 
is, you know, and less of your body. Step four is to pay attention to the presence of vibration that's in your environment, which the more relaxed you are, the more you're going to feel the vibration and the frequency of the energy that's around you. So the step five is to start bringing that vibration into your physical body and, le- and relax into that vibration because that's where your body is going to start to open up. This is to um, start to, to jiggle your energy more and, and get it ready to let go and release. And then step six is to focus your thoughts on leaving the limbs and the torso. So, you know, you know, looking at your feet and focusing on, you know, your energy moving your feet and then go up to your legs and then your mm-hmm. knees and all the way up. And then the step seven, you know, and it takes practice, but once you practice enough to raise that vibration, that's when you lift out of your body. And that's just your consciousness. And then you kind of go into like a lucid dreaming state where you're experiencing it. And I've done that with meditations. I remember one, and it was a guided meditation. And all of a sudden I was walking with one of my guides and he was taking me around to places and like opening doors and just showing, like, it was like, it was weird because it was in the middle of like, there was like garages all over and the the ground was just dirt. And he was walking to me to various garages and he would open the door and it'd be this whole different like, So like, oh, what, what's that movie? Uh, Christmas Story? Where they go to the different... Uh, I believe it's a Christmas story. Where the, the ghost of Christmas pass. Oh, and they go, and they, 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 like the Christmas Carol. Yeah, yeah, yeah the Christmas Carol. Yeah. And, and they... They show them things. Yeah. And yeah, it was sort of like that. You open up the garage door and it was this different kind of world. It, it felt like he was showing me the different possibilities and the different dimensions and mm-hmm. how you can how you can compartmentalize it in your head to put yourself there. Okay. But, you know, I, I know a lot of psychics who can, can do this and put themselves where other people are and see what they're doing. Okay. And they can do it consciously. I know quite a few. And I know some who can remote view where that's basically what they're doing. They're putting themselves into a complete stranger's house mm-hmm. and they mm-hmm. can see their house verbatim. They know what it looks like. They know what's going on in that house. Okay. You know, like... Kristen, she does it all the time. I was going to say, yeah. Yeah, she, it's, and so everybody's. She's one of those ones, like the, that gal we talked about, where she was able to see things, take herself to another place where she wouldn't normally, if she was in her physical body, wouldn't be able to see exactly what's yep. happening. Okay. So. <laughs> Um, we got OBE experience during near-death experiences. One common experience where OBEs are reported is in the near-death experiences, NDE. Dr. Raymond Moody, a pioneer in NDE research, first wrote about the common threads of OBE and NDE described by hundreds of subjects in his book, Life After Life. While the experiencers came from different backgrounds, many described multiple, multiple similar elements in their NDE and OBE, including hovering over their body, feeling disconnected, traveling down a tunnel of light, a sense of ineffability, seeing dead loved ones and returning to their bodies. See, the feeling disconnected, I know, I don't know, I just believe everybody has felt that, even under stress, Mm -hmm. you know, that that goes back to when we were talking about our experiences, you know, Ethan, you know, he just blocks himself off. He's just, he's disconnecting himself. Like you said earlier, that's a, our body. It's a coping mechanism. Yes. Yeah. It's a way to protect before. yourself yeah. energetically. Out-of-body experiences are powerful, regardless of the actual cause of an out-of-body experience. If you ever had one yourself, if you ever find yourself having one, you can expect it to be a very powerful experience, physically, emotionally, and many times even spiritually. However, you can be rest assured that most people who have the experience report it as being a very positive and uplifting one, and that there's nothing to be afraid of when it happens to you. So remember that. Well, fear holds us back. Just like um, the tantrics, they they master lucid out of body experience, which was basically you know what, what I talked about, where you're still that half halfway awake, aware of what's going on. Right. And they mastered it. So they could overcome the fear of death because they learned that we really aren't our bodies, our energies in these bodies, but we are not our bodies. So when um, our bodies die, we don't, we, right. we transform our energy. Right. And, um, 
and just like they they did um tests with athletes who and they taught them how to lucid dream so these the athletes would lucid dream and they'd go play their game and so it made them better athletes because they were it was like a simulation yeah it was almost like an emotional training yeah well as as by working in the dream they were able to visualize and how it felt in their practice and how to win and they actually required they acquired like the muscle memory for having winning habits so they were well, out better players able to win more games i found that fascinating right. that, that is that's, that's a that neat study really cool. for sure mm-hmm. for sure because that kind of it's a study where well anybody could be like oh well, not anybody, but instead of just people, like, you could tell that study to my brother, Mike, and he'd be like, oh, that's kind of neat, you know, versus yeah. if we were to tell them about the ones from from the um, Swiss group that ran the um, studies or whatever, you know, like, oh, okay, whatever, yeah, you know, he didn't hear, things. yeah, he didn't hear anything I just said, but if you say something like that, mm-hmm. he's like, oh, cool. That's, that's like thinking out of the box and trying it with different things to see what you get from Yeah, it. why not? It's not going to harm anybody. Mm-mm. Like, it's no. not going to physically hurt you. <laughs> nope. So, I got to say, YouTube out-of-body experiences are said to occur due, due to physiological and neurological factors. What? YouTube out of body See, that just sounds crazy. <clears throat> out-of-body experiences are curious, unexplained incidents during which a person feels like they are floating outside of their body as if a state of lucid dreaming. In some cases, OBEs occur right after a person falls asleep or during sleep. In other cases, they occur during a near-death experience. Sometimes... They may result from an <clears throat> immense physical strain. No conclusive explanation for OBEs has yet been reached in the scientific community. See, boom. <laughs> However, most researchers agree that the strange experience is caused by different psychological and n- neurological factors. Well, see, <clears throat> I'm okay with that because they say, okay, it's in the mind. Like, we always... The mind is such a beautiful and powerful thing, mm-hmm. way beyond anything we could ever explain. <clears throat> I don't care what kind of scientist you are or doctor. Ah, that I mean, they've been studying the brain for what a long time, and they still haven't figured everything out. And they're not yeah. going to because mm-hmm. it changes, and and it's supposed to. Like, I there's too much for me to say to put it in words, <laughs> or what I what I want to say. Yeah, they can tell us the science part of it, but I think it, it highly, highly goes beyond that. And as a a skeptic, a skeptic believer, no one can change my mind on that. Like, guess what they say? Okay. <laughs> our our. What do they call that? Uh, uh, oh my god, Your brain! <laughs> yeah, yeah, I die, 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 die. Um, the the chemical imbalances and stuff like that. You know it. Yeah, we know that they're there, but but why is that stuff happening? See, they that's where they yeah. they lose themselves and they just leave it. Okay, that's the end of our report. This is this is it. Okay, yeah, that's great, but they coincide together and they're. I need to figure out my words one of these days of what I want to say instead of just making grunting noises. Um, OBEs are not at all paranormal. Why are we talking about them? I'm just kidding. They <laughs> are too because you can't explain everything about it. That, look at that. That says it right there. That's dumb. Rather, they're more like a hallucination that is most likely caused by a perturbed brain that for some reason can't compute the different flows of sensory information. For some reason. <sighs> really? I'm not saying it's true, but if I had to argue on this on the side of spiritualism, that's what I would say. Or spirits, mm-hmm. I I would say, okay, for your some reason, that that that's our well, there's our physical self, and then there's our our, our spiritual self. Yeah, that's what I want to say, right? Mm-hmm. Okay, <laughs> we're two different things. We're cohabiting together, but we're in our meat suits essentially. Pretty much, yeah. These are just vessels. Yeah, they're just vessels, so, so we can come here and grow. But you, this is blatantly said. OBEs are not at all paranormal. Rather, they are more like hallucinations that is most likely caused by a perturbed brain that, for some reason, can't compute the di- different flows of sensory information. See, I had to read that twice. 
because that is, I'm not okay with that. <laughs> that that's a very closed minded. <laughs> oh, beyond belief. And there probably are situations where people. Well, they're so closed minded. Do hallucinate. But they can't even, that for some reason. Yeah. I'm giving, right, there's your reason. You just don't want to believe it because you're not at that point yet where you can wrap your head around it. You can't rationalize that. That's okay. Okay, there's some case studies here. I got an out-of-body experience case study one, psychology student. Um, FMRI studied, study by Andrea Smith and Claude Messer, the significantly activated regions of the brain while the participant was having extra corporal experiences or out-of-body experiences. Um, in 2014, researchers at the University of Ottawa studied the brain activity of a 24-year-old Canadian woman and a student of psychology who claimed she could leave her body at will. The woman asserted that she had learned how to leave her physical body behind when she was bored with sleep time, bored with sleep time at preschool. <laughs> That's cute. <laughs> I'm bored. <laughs> I'm bored with sleep time. I'm going to leave. This is overrated. <laughs> After attending a lecture on OBEs, she was surprised to discover that not everybody could leave their bodies whenever they pleased and approached her lecture to discuss the matter further. The woman claimed that she usually had an OBE right before falling asleep and that, in fact, leaving her body helped her fall asleep. During an OBE, she would sometimes feel herself rotating above her physical body. I feel myself moving or, more accurately, can make myself feel as if I am moving. I know perfectly well that I am not actually moving. There is no duality of body and mind when this happens. Not really. In fact, I'm a hypersensitive to my body at that point because I'm concentrating so hard on the sensation of moving. Researcher Claude Messer at the paper's co-author, Andrea M. Smith, interviewed the woman and had her undergo a brain scan during her self-induced OBE. What they discovered was that during the self-induced OBE, the woman's brain activations were confirmed confined to her left side, which is unusual because when most people imagine things or scenarios, both sides of the brain are active. In addition, the woman's visual cortex was deactivated, which was also strange because it was typically activated when one's, one imagines something happening in their head. The researchers came to the conclusion that the OBE, OBEs need to be studied further before a more conclusive interpretation can be drawn. Obviously, the main limitation of this study was the researchers' reliance on the participant reporting her experience truthfully. But they did throw in the picture of the brain scans. That's cool. They're, that That is cool. But again, they're like, well, because they can't fully explain it and they're not willing to say that, okay, yeah. you know, you are absolutely right. That this can happen. We don't know why, but it can. And that's okay. They're just like, nope. Well, there's a, a really cool movie that I watched a while ago, and it the the first thirty minutes was great. After that, kind of turned into your typical movie, but um, it's worth checking out for just like the first thirty minutes, and it's called Flatliners, and it was fascinating. They're all medical students, and the one girl she's really obsessed with the idea of an afterlife. She wants to find out what happens to your brain mm -hmm. when, after you die, mm -hmm. and so she cons a couple of her other you know fellow medical students into doing an experiment with her. And so they use defibrillation to stop the heart while recording her brain activity on a scanner. And so they, as she, as she's dying, they record what the brain is doing mm -hmm. while she's dying. And then when she gets to a certain point, they bring her back. So all of a sudden she, she starts to, um, when she comes back, she begins to recall memories of the past events and experiences, things that she had um, forgotten. She gets increased intelligence and euphoria. And then all of a sudden she can play the piano and answer questions in class perfectly and has no idea how. It's sort of like it activated a part of her brain. But, um, you know, I do want to see that. Have you no, it, yeah. And it was really good. And uh, just, just the idea that it gets you thinking, what does the brain go through? As as that's happening, as yeah. Not that you really want to think about that, but um, just like there's a there's a journal entry from I think from 2014 where you know it, it describes a near death experience, 
and he had a cardiac arrest, and he could describe what happened while the doctors tried to, to reactivate his heart. And he was the next second I was up there looking down at me. The nurse and another man who had had a bald head said, so far, it was assumed that the heart had stopped beating, and then all of a sudden, I was back in my body. Hmm. So they were working on him, trying to bring right. him back to life. And I don't know. Would you be scared? Yes. Or would you be calm? Um, depends on how much wine I had. Yeah, that's true. I mean, honestly. <laughs> did, I leave with, did I leave my body with the wine bottle? I'm okay. Yeah, no, exactly. wine bottle, not okay. <laughs> I'd probably just be a floating boo head. Ah, uh, yeah. Oh, that'd be scary. <laughs> I'm not a floating boo head. That's what happens when you deprive of wine. Well, the rest of that one with the case study one said, however, it is believed that the phenomenon might be more widespread than we believe. It's po quite possible that those who possess this unique ability do not find it remarkable in any way and thus choose not to share it with others. It's also possible that we all possess this ability as children, but lose it as we grow older. Mm -hmm. Yes, but I do think that... I think the second part is more likely. We lose it as we get older. Yep. I agree with that, definitely. I, I don't think it's a unique ability. I do think that we, we all can do it. Well, just, just got to be in the, that state kind of, of mind. Everybody has gift. Everybody has gifts to be a psychic reader or be a, a medium. It's whether you, you choose tap to, into it. Yeah. Right. Tap mm -hmm. into it and you choose to develop it again. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Put in the work. Yes, exactly. You've put in a lot of work. I do know that. I do. I, where you're, I, I've watched you grow since we've known each other. I try to dedicate a lot to mm -hmm. to actually growing, not just going in and giving psychic readings, but really growing personally with it. Yeah. So when I, when, mm -hmm. I, when I give a reading, I want to genuinely help people yes. find themselves mm -hmm. in whatever aspect of life makes them the happiest. Mm -hmm. I just want them to find that personal power and walk in their truth and yeah. feel confident enough to do it. Yeah, for sure. So case study two is Ms. Z, psychologist Charles Tart, who was in charge of the odd body experiences research on Ms. Z. In 1968, Dr. Charles Tart, professor of psychology at the University of California, Davis, studied an anonymous woman, later named Ms. Z, who could supposedly leave her body at will. The study consisted of placing a random number in this case, number five, on a shelf above the bed in which the woman slept. The woman was tasked with self-inducing an OBE, checking the number, and then reporting the number to Dr. Tart and his team upon her waking. The number was chosen after Miss Z had gone to sleep. It was written down and brought to Dr. Tart in an, in an envelope. Dr. Tart remained in the same room as the woman to ensure that she did not get up and check the number during the study. Dr. Tart was stunned when Miss Z woke up from her sleep and correctly stated the number on the shelf. At first, he thought that perhaps the number was reflected on some sort of reflective surface present in the room. However, the only surface reflective object in the room was a clock, f was a clock face. Dr. Tart and his assistant both lied down on the bed and tried to see whether it was possible to make out the number on the clock face. Both Dr. Tart and his assistant concluded that the number was not visible on the clock face in the dim lighting of the room. Dr. Tart's description of Miss Z could perhaps explain why she experienced OBEs. My informal observation of her over a period of several months, undoubtedly distorted by the fact that one can never describe one's friends objectively, resulted in a picture of a person who is in some ways was quite mature and insightful and in other ways so extremely disturbed psychologically that at times when she lost control, she could possibly be diagnosed as schizophrenic. Well, we had a conversation about that before, mm -hmm. I believe, with people that diagnosed with schizophrenia. Um, or some of the other ones. Well, the split, split personality dis disorders. Yes. You know, I've always, I always kind of wondered to myself, I'm sure there are cases out there, but I've always wondered like way back in the 1800s when people would say they're two different people or would act like another person because they're, they're a physical medium and spirit can overtake them mm -hmm. and communicate through them or because they hear people, they get thrown into a loony bin. They're, they're just, it's a gift medium. Yeah. But, yeah. But then. Mm -hmm. And then they get all drugged up, and then that causes other things yeah. that aren't, yeah. Then that's what drives them crazy. Right. Yeah, it's, 
That would be a long... Um, or the people who allow themselves to be driven crazy because they were hearing voices and because they were so closed off. I think, I think that would be were. an awesome um, uh, uh, research to do, uh, a study for somebody to do that had the resources to mm-hmm. do it. I think that would be... I think that would be neat. Um, case study three, a 57-year-old anonymous man. United States Air Force, the awareness during... Resuscitation? No. Oh, what? What? <laughs> what Mama Mary said, <laughs> study also known as AWARE study, examined the brain and consciousness of cardiac arrest patients during... During, during resuscitation? <laughs> <laughs> Over the years, cardiac arrest survivors have reportedly reported the ability to observe and later recall the activities that occurred during the is it resuscitation? Yeah. Oh, what? The resuscitation. As a result, in 2014, a study was carried out in 15 U.S., U.K., and Australian hospitals in order to observe possible OBEs among those who have undergone cardiac arrest. To properly test the accuracy of claims of visual awareness during cardiac arrest, arrest resuscitation, each hospital installed 50, 100 shelves in those areas where cardiac arrest resuscitation was most likely to take place. Every shelf had a random image placed on top of it, which only could be seen looking down from the ceiling. Cardiac arrest survivors who were resuscitated and the chosen hospitals were later interviewed. Two patients in particular experienced specific auditory or visual awareness during resuscitation. However, one of the patients was unable to continue with the study due to poor health. The other patient, a 57-year-old man, described how he was able to observe what was happening in the room during his resuscitation from the top corner of the room. According to the man, he was looking down at the room. The patient correctly recalled the event, sounds, people, and people present in the room during his resuscitation. The man mentioned an automated external defibrillator, which, according to his metal record, medical records, was indeed used during his resuscitation. Unfortunately, the man's resuscitation took place in an area where no shelves had been placed, and thus further analysis of his OBE was impossible. However, the study strongly suggested that the conscious awareness could be present during cardiac arrest, even if clinically this this consciousness is undetectable. Again, it, it, they're like, oh, meh. because he couldn't, I probably told them things about going on in that room, but just because they didn't set it up the way that they, mm-hmm. yeah. Case study four, out-of-body experience in people with vestibular d- disorders. <laughs> Wikimedia... Commons A perspective study of 210 patients with dizziness found that OBEs could be connected to vestibular vestibular disorders. In a recent study, a neuroscientist named Christopher Lopez from Ex Marisville University and a vestibular disorder doctor named Maya teamed up to study and compare 210 patients with dizziness. With the 210 patients with no dizziness. Out of the 210 patients who experienced dizziness, 14% said they also experienced OBEs. On the other hand, only 5% of those who did not experience dizziness claimed they regularly experienced OBEs. Those patients who experienced dizziness, as well as depression or anxiety, were more likely to experience an OBE. Researchers of this study believe that OBEs could be caused by damage to people's ears, or more specifically, the vestibular system in the inner ear that aids people in controlling balance and eye movement. Vestibular system problems often result in dizziness and floating sensations. It's also worth mentioning that the study found that most patients only experience OBEs after experiencing dizziness for the first time. The study included that OBE in patients with dizziness may arise from a combination of perceptual incoherence invoked by the vestibular dysfunction with psychological fa- factors and neurological factors. See, I never would have guessed, I never would have put dizziness in there, but... I could see there'd be, where there'd be a possibility of people having something like that where it would cause that. I wouldn't, I wouldn't take that and explain it completely. Right. You know? I say it's kind of a far reach that, like, they just kind of wanted to do a study on yeah. something. Mm-hmm. But, yeah, that was that. I don't see how, I mean, what's it called, um, when you're really dizzy? Vert- vertigo. Yeah. So that's mm-hmm. basically what they're talking about. Right? Yeah, yeah. Which that's fine. People do suffer from that, but at the same time, I don't. I don't know what that has to do with. I think it more make you want to throw up. Mm-hmm. 
my, my cousin, she gets bad spells of vertigo. But I, I don't think that makes her chances of having an out-of-body experience more. more. Yeah. we. I do have um two stories that I would like to read that people wrote in from the Facebook about out-of-body right. experiences. One is from our own Joshua Hill. Hey. Hill. Yeah. Hey. Uh, I posted on our page um, about out-of-body experiences and who has had one. He put, kind of, I have lucid dreams consistently. And I did learn one important thing, though. If you are trying to have lucid dreams and don't know how to do it, you can wind up having sleep paralysis. I have had sleep paralysis many, many times over. It is a lot less scary when you understand what it is, but still frightening if you're not ready for it. Yeah. See, Destiny's been complaining about, not complaining, but (laughs) her sleep paralysis is getting, like, almost like a daily thing to her. Mm -hmm. It's scaring her. I don't know anything about it. Yeah, well, sort of like what he said, knowing that um, the lucid dreaming it basically means you can control your dream. Mm-hmm. It, so it's finding ways, doing some research to go ahead and control that dream better so you're not just snapping awake and all of a sudden you're still half in that lucid dream. Your mind's awake, but your body's not. Exactly. So that's what it they is. They need to line back up at the right time. And so I would suggest to her when that happens, instead of panicking, kind of um, deep breathing. And you, you could even just decide to go back to sleep. And it'll pop you back into that lucid dream until your body's ready to wake up, too. You okay. pop yourself back into that dream. So I think what we concluded here is <laughs> with the sleep paralysis, it's your... Your spiritual side isn't quite in your body yet. Is that right? Kind of, yeah. It, it's like, um, yeah, because it's so over there in that dream, mm-hmm. you can't tell the body to move. Right. Kind of over there in that other realm. Yeah. It hasn't lined back up yet, but your body's mm-hmm. like, I want to wake up. And you're like, no, because I'm not there yet. We need both of us to, to Or work. even just, you know, if you don't want to pop back into the dream, relaxing, because mm-hmm. mm-hmm. if you panic, that's... Makes it worse. Right. Makes it scary. Yeah, control your own energy. We have another one here from Kirk McGurk. When I was 19 years old in a large, loud jail dormitory, I began reading classic literature, drawing portraits of authors, working out, and meditating. I felt like I was really finding my center. One night falling asleep, I had a dream that I was walking down the street, but it wasn't me. I was viewing someone, someone's life through their eyes. When I awoke, I was told by my fellow inmates that I had been asleep for almost three days. It was at that moment I knew I wasn't the person who had gone to bed just 70 hours earlier. That was the beginning of my spiritual enlightenment, to which I suppose has no end. No, it is. That's crazy. And what he was he was probably seeing him in a past life. Okay. And it, yeah. Okay. Yes. Um, I guarantee that's what he was seeing. Three because, days. Because energetically, he probably felt familiar in some shape or form. Right. It just wasn't him. It was probably him in a past. It life. wasn't that physical him. Yeah. Huh. That's interesting. It is. I think. Good story. Yeah. They both were. Um, is it, you got anything else? <laughs> no. We did. Kind of got off track a little bit, but that's kind of what we do. Yeah, so. Uh, got a little heated. Well, very heated because it's flipping hot today, but yeah. So, thank you all for joining us on this episode of PXL. We love you all. And remember, don't yuck someone else's yum. Ever. Also, don't forget to look us up on the Facebook, Paranormal XL. Or if you go and put at XL, Paranormal, all lowercase. Also, write in your stories. Tell us things. If you have any good places that are great for investigations or ideas, any things you want to hear. Yeah, the show. Email us. That's the best way to contact us. So much gets lost on Facebook. It just truly does. So if anybody is listening, we have not gotten back to you. It's so much does get lost because if you send us a message or whatever, it goes through something else. And then you got to hit like three different links to get to it. It's the craziest thing. I'm like, how am I ever going to know when somebody sends us Mm -hmm. a message like that? So just send us an email, um, paranormalxl at writeme.com. So we will see you. We will not see you. You will hear us next week. Love you all and thank you. Bye.
Thank <laughs> you.